Hello everyone and welcome to the quick fire revision for India S2. This is a standard on inventories and it's by and large similar to the standard that you studied in your AS2. So the standard is divided into three parts. First, how do you measure the cost of the inventories? Second, figuring out how does the cost flow? That is first in, first out, weighted average, etc. So that is cost flow assumptions and third is the inventory valuation. Now we'll quickly discuss the important principles over here and the key adjustments to remember. First, what all is inventory? Well, inventory is usually items which you hold for the purpose of sale or for the purpose of consumption in the ordinary course of business. And hence, inventory can constitute of items like stock in trade or finished goods, which we typically hold for the purpose of sale, or even raw materials, work in progress, uh, or consumables, stores and spares, etc., which are held for the purpose of consumption, but in the ordinary course of business. Now, how do you measure inventory? Well, the initial recognition of inventory happens at cost. So when you recognize inventory at cost, you will take the purchase price plus you will add the directly attributable expenses which are necessary to get the inventory in the location and condition as desired by the management. Regarding taxes, you will add the non-creditable and non-refundable taxes and in case the inventory is a qualifying asset which is taking a substantial period of time and which is not being uh, manufactured through a repetitive process in mass production, we can even add subject to certain conditions borrowing cost. This is for inventories that have been purchased. It is possible that inventories have been constructed in which case, instead of taking the purchase price, you will take the direct material plus the direct labor plus the variable overheads which are linked to production. Regarding fixed overheads, we will take the fixed overheads using the absorption costing method where you will calculate the absorption rate subject to certain adjustments and you will include it. Remember while you are considering, you will take only the fixed as well as the variable production overheads. Administrative overheads as well as selling and distribution overheads will not be a part of the cost of the inventory. The standard gives you certain guidance including what should not be included in the part, part of the cost of the inventory which includes selling and administrative overheads whether it is fixed or variable. It includes abnormal losses and storage cost in case the storage does not result in a necessary change in the condition of the inventory as desired. There is some special guidance which is also given regarding normal as well as abnormal losses. So when we are looking at normal loss, we have been uh, we have been taught that as per gap, we will include normal cost as a part of the cost. How does normal loss include as a part of the cost? You will take the total purchase price or total production cost divided by the normal units. Usually, you will divide by the normal units to find the cost per unit. In which case, the normal loss will form as a go as a part of the cost. However, if there is any abnormal loss, abnormal loss goes to the PNL, and in case there is an abnormal gain, remember abnormal gain usually is not taken to the PNL, and hence the general principle is you will take the total cost divided by the normal units or the actual units, whichever is higher. So, if there is any abnormal loss, the abnormal loss can go to the PNL account. However, if there is any abnormal gain, the abnormal gain will be taken separately, uh, adjusted along with the cost. When we look at fixed overheads absorption. So the absorption over here is usually the budgeted overheads divided by the budgeted level of activity which is usually the number of units. When we take the budgeted level of activity we usually take the normal units. However, the rule over here is if the normal is equal to actual that, mean, that means nothing abnormal has happened and hence whatever is your fixed production overheads divided by the normal units can be taken. However, if the normal is less than the actual uh, that is the actual is greater that means there must be an abnormal gain and hence you can take the total fixed production over it's divided by the actual units. However, if the, nor if the normal is greater than the actual, that means if you are expecting 1 lakh units and only 50,000 units could be made, maybe something abnormal would have happened and because you are manufacturing lesser units, that seems to be like an abnormal loss and hence the standard over here says that you will calculate the absorption rate as the normal uh, based on the normal units, that is the total fixed overheads divided by the normal units. Long story short, while calculating the cost per unit to be allocated for the fixed production overheads, in the denominator you will take the normal units or the actual units whichever is higher. This is in order to incorporate the effects for abnormal loss going to the PNL whereas the abnormal gain being adjusted into the cost per unit. The last part over here in case of special cases would be joint products and byproducts. In case a particular joint cost is incurred and there are two joint products and then the byproduct which is manufactured but a byproduct is a product which was not originally intended to be manufactured however the nature of the production process is such that the byproduct gets manufactured in which case you will calculate the net joint cost the net joint cost over here will be the total joint cost minus 
the NRV of the byproducts. That is the sale value, net realizable value of the byproducts. That will give you the net joint cost, and the net joint cost will be allocated to the main units, the joint products, in the ratio of their sales value at split off point. You can calculate the cost per unit for each of these units, considering the cost allocated based on the sales value at the split off point. Okay. Next is the cost flow assumptions. This is not something which is very important, but in terms of cost flow assumptions, this is how you are assuming the cost to flow. Like if inventory items are not interchangeable, like something uh, like special paintings, etc. In which case you will follow the specific identification method to allocate cost. However, if inventory units are interchangeable, which is there in most of the cases. So if I'm a dealer of tires and I have 50 tires, I can interchange and sell any of those tires. So if inventory units are interchangeable, then the general principle that you can follow is going to be either FIFO, first in first out or weighted average. That is you take the total cost of the opening as well as the current year's units divided by the total number of opening plus the current units. That will give you the weighted average cost per unit. LIFO, remember, is not permitted. However, in certain special businesses like manufacturers which have a long production history, standard cost method is also permitted provided the standard cost reasonably approximates the actual cost. And in case of certain retailers like departmental stores, for example, you are also permitted to take the retail sales price method, which is the total selling price minus the gross margin, not the, not the EBIT margin, not the net profit margin, but the gross margin to find the cost per unit. Remember, these are optional methods and can be used only if an entity wants. Otherwise, they can follow fee for weighted average as required. So, the last part of the standard involves evaluation. The measurement of inventory happens at the lower of cost or NRV for the finished goods as well as work in progress, where cost is calculated as discussed earlier, whereas NRV is the estimated selling price minus the estimated selling expenses minus the estimated cost to complete. Here it is very pertinent to note that the measurement of NRV happens based on the estimated selling price and it does not happen based on fair value. Like every other standard like Indes 41 for biological assets, Indes 105 for non-current assets sold for sale, Indes 109 financial instruments, everywhere the measurement is based on fair value. Fair value is a value as on 31st March, that is the balance sheet date, whereas estimated selling price is a value that you estimate for the inventory that the inventory will fetch, let us say if it is sold in the post balance sheet period. And hence, the actual selling price of this inventory in the post balance sheet period, assuming the inventory is in the same condition and not damaged. So, the actual selling price of this inventory in the post balance sheet period gives you additional information of a potential estimated selling price that can be expected as on the balance sheet. This is where students make a lot of mistake. A very simple example for this would be, let us say if I'm a car manufacturer and I'm selling cars. I am effecting a price increase from 1st April. So on 31st March, my cars are selling at 500 rupees and from 1st April, I'm going to sell them at 550 rupees. So the fair value on 31st March will be 500 because that is the actual price at which a willing buyer and seller will transact on 31st March. However, inventory measurement is based on NRV and NRV is based on the estimated selling price and the estimated selling price on 31st March, you're expecting to sell the car in the future at 550 rupees and hence the NRV measurement will be based on 550. If nothing is available, then we can always assume that the estimated selling price will equal to the fair value but if it is available then inventory measurement has to be based on the estimated selling price from which you will subtract the estimated selling expenses and the estimated cost to complete the product that will give you the nrv this is for finished goods or let us say work in progress however when we are looking at raw materials generally raw materials or consumables are held for the purpose of consumption and hence we don't intend to sell them and hence ideally their nrv should not be relevant and hence Raw material stock should ideally be measured at cost only. You should not really compare it with NRV. So the general principle is raw material inventory should be at cost. However, Indias mentions that while measuring the base for raw materials, you will compare the cost of the finished goods with the NRV of the finished goods. So if the cost of the finished goods is greater than the NRV, that means it is a loss making finished good, then the standard says that you will measure the raw materials at the lower of cost or the replacement cost. On the other hand, if the cost of the finished goods is great, is lower than the NRV of the finished goods, cost is lower, that means NRV is greater, so it's a profitable finished good, then you measure the raw material at cost only. The logic behind this is generally thought that ideally raw material is used for the purpose of consumption. As on the balance sheet, it is still raw material, so it is not consumed. However, if it is a profitable finished good, it is likely that this raw material will be consumed and if it is consumed, it will not be sold and hence you will measure it at cost only. However, if it is a loss making finished good, it is possible that you might not go ahead with the manufacturing process and as a result, what will I do with the raw material in such a case? In such a case, I might potentially have to sell it and hence I compare the cost. Ideally, I should be compared with NRV, but NRV is based on the estimated selling price and I don't really sell inventory in the ordinary course of business and hence, instead of taking the estimated selling price, I will take the 
replacement cost that is i'm assuming i'm allowed to assume over here that the price at which i'm going to sell the inventory of raw materials will be equal to the price at which i'm purchasing the inventory of these raw materials and hence for the purpose of raw material stock we are allowed to compare the cost of the raw material with the replacement cost of the raw material replacement cost is a price at which i can buy the raw material the last part over here can involve subsequent reassessment of NRV like you have measured the inventory whose initial cost is 100 and the NRV has become 80. You have measured this inventory at 80 and hence recorded at 20 rupees right off. This inventory let us say over the next year also remains unsold and now the NRV let us say becomes 95 or the NRV becomes 105. So can I reverse the write off already recorded? The answer is yes because you will measure it at the lower of cost. Cost is 100 remember. It is the carrying value of the inventory cost is still 100. You measure it at the lower of cost or NRV and the NRV now is 95. In which case the inventory should be at 95 but in your ledger it is at 80 and hence there is a 15 rupees write off or you measure it at 100 or 105 whichever is lower that is 100. But in your ledger the inventory is at 80 and hence you can reverse the write off to the extent of 20 rupees over here. So this by and large takes care of the standard for inventory. I hope uh, this has been a quick recap for the standard. So uh, wish you all the very best. Study hard. Please do like, share and subscribe and hit the bell button for getting notifications. I'll see you soon with the next video. Bye-bye. Take care.